Well, today is uh, Father's Day, so we're going to do a, perhaps I'll finish this today, we're just going to, we, we finished walking with Abraham last week, so we're going to do walking with the fathers, okay? You can say walking with the patriarchs, but let's focus it a little bit more on the fathers. <clears throat> Now, I already mentioned, of course, Abraham is the father of faith, but, but we mentioned the importance of having a child or a son in the days of Abraham. Because with all, with all the blessings, all the promises, and all the wealth that Abraham gained, what's, what's the use? Ultimately, uh, uh, he's going to die. Now, he, uh, he died at the age of 175. The promise during that time is 120. But uh, Abraham died at 175 years old. Now, that is old. Now, with all the wealth accumulated through that time, if he doesn't have an heir, what's the use? Or it will end, it will end in his life. We mentioned also that when God made a promise to Abraham, the, the extensiveness of the blessing cannot be fulfilled in the times of Abraham. Because it, it took, it took uh, thousands of years uh, before it's, it's, it's fulfilled and it's going to be fully fulfilled after thousands of years, at least, at least 6,000 years perhaps or, or 4,000 years. And so that means that God said, the promise is unto you and unto your children. And we were mentioning that uh, for some parents who failed to raise children in the fear and knowledge of God, who doesn't have the passion of the fathers, that's the end of their generation. That's just it, you know. Remember David's relationship with uh, Jonathan? David is supposed... Uh, to bless Jonathan. But then he died, and so it, it, it took him a long time. Whom, whom can I bless from the house of Jonathan? Until he found Mephibosheth. But sooner or later, Mephibosheth also died. And so there's no more. That's the end of it. And so the uh, possible length of relationship between these families just ended. The line of David continued, but not the line of Jonathan. And it's the same today. And and in, in fact, in the propagation of the faith, there will be uh, a good amount of revival throughout history. And the next or, th or the third generation after that, it dies. Why? Because almost all generation fails to a large degree in discipling their children. And, and we see that even in our days. The failure is so massive because we just take it for granted. It's like, it's like almost like an American citizenship. The uh, former leaders of, of, of this country, even the current leaders, are ignoring totally, totally uh, patriotism, you know. Uh, DJ graduated last Sunday. The, the national anthem of the U.S. was not even sung. Yeah. I was wondering what's, what's going on with this, with this country. Can you imagine a, a graduation where federal money and state money is being given. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars being given. And, and not even, not even, uh, I, I didn't see the plug of the U.S. either. It's, it's graduation. And, and so what happened is the, the passion of the Americans for this country is gone. Meaning the, uh, the last generation of, of fathers, the, the last generation of our fathers have failed in passing on that kind of patriotism. And so it's really up to our generation or the next generation to pick up from where they abandoned the patriotism. Faith is the same. We, we are, I am first generation Christian in my family. My father first got born again. My wife is uh, first generation also in her family. Supposedly, my, my kuya is called to the ministry. Well, he did not follow God. My, my sister, younger sister, 
followed God and became a pastor. My, uh, all of my siblings got born again. A couple of them backslid. Okay? Now, I was told that uh, before my brother next to me died, he gave back his life to Jesus. Now, you just, you just uh, take it as it is said. But I don't know how true it is, but you hope for the best. He died a drug addict. You know? And his, his children... He was not able to pass on the faith to children. That's the end of my brother. That's it. No more. Yeah. And so, uh, as we, we look at each other, the massive failure, even in this church, in uh, raising from our generation children who will, who will catch the same fire, the same passion that we have. Now, <clears throat> I'm already aware of that before getting married, so me and my wife became very intentional in making sure that faith is passed on. In everything, when, when we need something, when our children need something, we always, we always tell them we should pray about it. Why? Because, you, you know, you, I, I told you most people don't think. Uh, most voters don't think. Just most people don't think. That's just the way it is. We, and the, the sad thing about that is we think we are thinking when we are not actually thinking. You know? And so sometimes we assume that faith will be automatically passed on. Nothing is automatic. We cannot, we cannot underestimate the value of praising our children in the fear and knowledge of God and to walk into righteousness. Why? Because... Not everyone will choose to walk in the blessing. Not everyone will choose to walk in covenant with God. Now remember, walking in covenant with God is a life commitment. We, we, the evangelicals, the modern evangelicals, simplified it too much. They simplified it by the raising of, the, of their hands. Who wants to give their lives to Jesus? Raise your hand. They raised their hands. They thought they already gave their lives to Jesus because they raised their hands. That is not even in the Bible. I, I told you the uh, altar calls only happen in the second great awakening. In the times of Jesus, the apostles, they will be teaching the word of the Lord. In the times of the prophets, they'll be teaching the word of the Lord. How do you know somebody believed? Because they follow the teachings that they heard. Their life turned around. There were no altar calls. I mean, show me in the scriptures when Jesus gave an altar call. At one, I mean, sometimes we rejoice. Oh, my, my, uh, my children, my, my parents, my siblings came to church. What are you rejoicing about? You see? Oh, they submitted themselves to water baptism. So, remember when, when the Pharisees went to John the Baptist and wanted to submit themselves for water baptism? John got upset and said, show me fruits that meet repentance. Then I'll baptize you. Today, any pastor will just simply keep dunking them on water and putting, filling up a sheet saying, well, five more additional, five more additional. Can you imagine if, if uh, I, I told you in the late, eight, late 70s, if the number of respondents to altar calls is true, a lot of them are lies. Bishop uh, George uh, Castro of the MLF Independent uh, Methodist Church in the Philippines, Yemeni Church. He, he made an accounting of all the respondents of the altar calls from the 50s to the late 70s. He said, if these numbers are true, the Philippines should have been saved five times. Five times. So during that time, the population of the Philippines was, uh, I think, something like 40 million people. The number of respondents is around, is around 200 million. So, so it's being evangelistic, just evangelistically counted. Meaning we are, we are not interested in true repentance. We are, we are just interested in the show of conversion, not, not the real conversion. That's why faith is not being passed. We, we, have, we have to be interested in making sure that, that the faith 
of our fathers is passed. Now, of course, me, I'm not interested in passing the faith of my father before he gets born again. I mean, we get him saved. Because the faith that my father has is false faith. He was not born again. We, we got him born again. So I was not interested in that. But I am interested in making sure that my children gets the blessing that I have or I pass the faith. Otherwise, that's the end of it. You know, uh, To whom will God give the blessing? It requires a people who will have the commitment and the faith to say, I want the blessing. And so for Father's Day, let's talk about walking with the fathers. Let's, let's begin with the topic of passing of the blessing. Okay, Let's go to chapter 25 of Genesis, <clears throat> starting on verse 1. Abraham had taken another wife. Say another wife. There's nothing wrong with being, being married again if your spouse die, okay? Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimram, Joksan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Maybe the last one is Chinese, huh? Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Didan. Didan's sons were the Ashurim, Letushim, and Leumim, and Midian, sons of Ipa, Eper, Hanok, Abida, and Elda. Now, remember the Midianites were among those who conquered Israel. And it was, it was the judge Gideon who delivered them from the Midianites. So Gideon delivered Israel from their relatives. Why? Because Abraham at the age of around 137 decided it's not enough. He got married again. If he did not get married, Midian will not be born. You see? <clears throat> Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac. Say everything. I, I, wish, I wish we will pay attention to this because because even Christian parents do not know, they have no clue how to pass on the blessings that God is giving them. Now, I'm, I'm a father of five, and the Lord is blessing me and my wife. I need to know how to pass on that blessing. Not everybody can get that blessing. Okay? Here it says, after mentioning that... Uh, now, remember, there was also Ishmael. huh? After mentioning... The new children of Abraham, the Bible says, Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac. This was while he was still alive. When he can see who took on his faith and followed the ways of the Lord. Okay, so. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. Say concubines. concubines. Say it again. So it turned out, <clears throat> not only did Abraham at the age of 137, anybody here 137? Married Keturah, he got concubines. How many concubines? I don't know, at least two. Because plural, so more than one, at least two. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines, and while he was still alive, again, while he was still alive, he sent them eastward, away from his son Isaac. Say, away from his son Isaac. Away from his son Isaac. You know, I, I do not know why some parents insist on, on pushing their children to the ungodly uh, people. Here, Abraham pushed away all the ungodly. And said, away from my son. Who is the eldest in all of this? Isaac. And later on, I'll tell you how old Isaac was when these kids were born. 
Okay. How old was Isaac when, uh, when he was sacrificed by Abraham? Between 30 to 35. Okay. So, uh, 10 years, uh, no, no. That same year, of course, they say, Abraham uh, ma married Keturah. So at the age of around 40 to 45, maybe we, we, the, first, the first extra, extra child of Abraham was born. He was, a, he was like a father to those children by age difference. And yet, Abraham did not say, well, they're young, they're not going to mess up with my son. He drove them away, away from his son. To the land of the east, this is the length of Abraham's life. 175 years. How many of you here wants to live up to 175? Huh? No, I don't want to live up to 175. I want to live forever, you know. He took his last breath and died at a good old age. And, and contented. Not only did he die at the good old age, he died contented. How many of us say we die today, we say, I'm contented. That, that is, a lot of people die without, not contented. How do you know they're not contented? They're, they're, they're still, they're still uh, striving to keep on living. You know, I and I were talking to an elderly individual, and he said, I don't care if all of my money is, is spent. I want my life extended to the last minute. He's, he's, he's not contented. You see, Abraham, when his time came, he said, ah, I'm happy. I told you the story of uh, Kenneth E. Hagen. He was asked, when are you going to die? He said, after I'm contented. He said, after I'm satisfied. So he was having breakfast with the Retha one morning. And they were reading their Bible. He stopped. Look at his wife like that. He smile and die. Yeah. Took a last glance on his wife and then died. Praise God. At least he looked at his wife for the last time, you know. He took his last breath and died at good old age, contented, and he was gathered to his people. Look at this. He was gathered to his people. A, a, die, a, a dead person in those days, to where is he normally gathered with? God with his fathers. Where was the father of Abraham buried? In Iran. They came from Iran, north of where Abraham was. Terah was buried there. He did not want to be buried with his father. Instead, he was buried with his people. Who are his people? I mean, who are his people? There was no people who died except Sarah. But here he says he was buried with his people. I want, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I'm going to show you later on the, uh, the lessons behind these statements. <clears throat> with his people, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar, the Hittite. So now Ishmael returned after, after uh, 38 years. Ishmael returned after 38 years. He heard that his father died. Well, he's just, he's just east of where uh, Isaac was. So he traveled west and buried his dad with, with uh, Isaac. This was the field that Abraham bought from the Hittites. Abraham was buried there with his wife, Sarah, after Abraham's death. God blessed his son Isaac, who lived near Beer Lahai Rowai. Now, where did Isaac bury? Another great lesson here. Uh, from the fathers. Where did Isaac bury Abraham? 
from the cave of Machpelah. Who paid for it? He did. Now, he's already rich and Isaac is rich. He did not bother his son to pay for his burial. I'm, I'm telling you especially today, uh, I, I think one of the preparations that parents should make is to make sure that when you go home to be with the Lord, your children are not burdened with uh, your burial. Because especially if you have not passed on the faith to them, they, they don't know how to make wealth, uh, you're going to be a big problem. You know. So here, Abraham prepared even for his burial. Lots of lessons to be learned here. So after the death of Sarah, Abraham took another wife. Again, this is not a sin, but neither did it say, it was, it's not a sin, but neither did it say that Abraham asked God about this decision. Remember, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. I am convinced that uh, whether in life or in death, doing business, getting married, I believe we should be asking God. My, my, my wife, uh, whenever she's, she's having a bad day, will ask me, are you going to get married after I die? As if she's going to die first, you know. Uh, the probability is I'll die first. But uh, she will ask me, are you going to get married first? Are you going to get married again? I, my answer to her is, no, I've learned my lesson, you know. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge to get married. And uh, before I married my wife, I asked the Lord. I prayed. No, nobody can, can force me. There was a lot of pressure in the Philippines for me to, to get married. At one time, my pastor was insinuating perhaps I'm gay, you know. Uh, I, I, would, I refuse to be pressured like that. I, I believe in marrying at, uh, at the right time under the uh, word of the Lord. Prayed about it. And that is when I got married. Remember, when we got married, it was not the right time in the world because I just finished the school and I only have $167 in my pocket with no job, so to speak. But we felt that it was the right time for us to get married. So we got married and never missed a meal, you know, and the Lord just keep uh, blessing us. Never beg for money either, okay? Why? Because, because the steps of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord. Are there a lot of people today getting married ahead of time? Yes. I think that's obvious. We have seen some people get involved in a relationship in the wrong time. Now, on purpose, I have been telling you, I, I told Joseph and John they can, they can date now. None of my other kids are allowed. Okay? Now, the reason for that is because parents ignore that. They allow their kids to do whatever they want, and then they resent the decisions they're making. Why are you not exercising leadership? That's part of the leadership that God has given to the fathers. And the reason why I'm saying that in public is because I'm trying to show you this is what I see from the Scriptures, and this I believe how we should live because that's what we see from the Word of the Lord. Now, the modern man will, will, will disagree with that. That's why the modern man is a mess. Because there is no more guidance coming from the scriptures. But if we follow the scriptures, parents actually, especially the fathers, have a lot of leadership and authority given to them by God. You know? And a lot of children today are sinning doing premarital sex because they, they start dating before they even know how to spell their name. What are you going to do when you date? Just look at each other? No, you're not going to end up... You, you, you can fool yourself, but you will not just end up looking at each other. You'll end up having sex because, because uh, we are living in a very promiscuous society. And, and, so, and so it is important that, that the fathers... Now, this is Father's Day, so I'm teaching this. The fathers learn how to raise their children in the fear and knowledge of God. Sarah died at 127. Abraham is 10 years older than Sarah. So Sarah died at 127, 
Abraham was 137. Abraham died at 175. 175 minus 137, around 38 years. So he was married for another 38 years and had children for the next 38 years. When was, what, what is the, the distance between the kids? I don't know, okay? But uh, he died at 175. So, so now he knows he's going to die. Uh, I know if Jesus tarry, I'm going to die. And we all know if Jesus tarry, we're all going to die. So if you are a parent and you have children, do you just die? Some, some parents are very irresponsible. They keep borrowing from uh, money, say, from, from their house, hoping that their children will take over paying that. So you are actually uh, passing on debts, not blessings. Now, <clears throat> Abraham was extremely wealthy and powerful. So he knew he was going to die. If he knew he was going to die and we're going to walk with Abraham, what did Abraham do? Abraham made preparations for his heir. There comes a point, I believe, that parents should be making preparations for their death. Now, me and my wife may not have that much, but we already have a will. Uh, we even we, we know how whatever we have that we leave will be distributed now we're still very young but we already have that now some parents are, are, are very irresponsible when, when, when their kids talk about hey listen prepare the will why you want me to die that's what my father told me okay we, we own all of the family lands in our province, my, my father paid for all of them. They were all buried in debt, and my father paid for everything. And my mother was lamenting, telling me, your father refused to put in his name all our properties in the province. We have farms there. And uh, all the farms of our family belong to us. And, and so I was, I was already a pastor, so I talked to my father. And I said to my father, you better transfer all of the titles in your name. Oh, my father was furious. <laughs> he looked at me and says, why? You want me to die now? I said, no. I said, because you have a wife. And he said, no, you just want what I have. So I made a deal with my father. I said, transfer all the properties to your name. And I'm telling you, Tata, I said, I will not partake of anything that you have. I told him that. I said, but, but my mother needs that. I said, but I promise you, I will not take anything from you. And uh, so he went to the province. He was not born again yet to, uh, to, cha to transfer everything to his, uh, to his name. Well, he went to the province, got drunk, and came back home without a title. Years later, my father died. Guess what? He's dead. How much does my mother have? Nothing. Except the house that we have in Metro Manila. Which I put in the name of my father and my mother. They want to put it in my name. But I was true to my word. I said, no, I'm not going to get anything from you. Yeah. That's what happened when somebody is... That's the responsibility of my father. So I remember going back to the Philippines... My mother was lamenting that. He said, Jose, I did not get anything. Why? Because you think that when somebody is asking you to prepare your will, they are preparing for your death. No, they are not. They are just making the wise decision, especially in our society that is legally uh, burdened. And so, Abraham made, not all, now remember he already from what we read, he gave everything to Isaac. It's done. Isaac, you own everything. 
He was still alive. Okay? So, but what are the other preparations that, uh, that uh, Abraham made? Now, remember, he is the father of faith. He believes God. He is in covenant with God. But being in faith does not exempt you from doing your due diligence. Oh, God is watching over me. I don't have to do all of those legal things. I don't have to do all of those uh, medical things. You're wrong. You have to do them. Because Abraham lived by faith, but he did his due diligence. Number one, he sent Ishmael out of the camp. Okay? That's the first thing he did. Ishmael, out of here. Now, that is under the uh, instigation of his wife. But God told him, listen to your wife. Actually, uh, Sarah was more sensitive to uh, who will be the heir of Abraham. And when Isaac was born, she said, well, this is it. Can't be Ishmael, son of a slave, a slave a woman. So he made that, he made that, he did not live. And I think this is very important. Abraham did not live the, the big decisions to his children. Okay, to his son. I think it's totally irresponsible when, when somebody doesn't live a will and the children end up fighting. They're not supposed to fight. You, you're supposed as a father settle that before your death. Well, I don't want to have any part of it. I don't want to, to uh, be accused of playing favorites. What do you care? You're going to die anyways. You know? But, but this is part of responsibility. Now, the other children could have gone after Isaac, but, but Abraham says, no. He pushed out Ishmael, which was, who was the eldest. And then, by this time, by this time, uh, Isaac, by age reckoning, is already old by our standard. <laughs> and he thinks that it's about a time for his son Isaac to be married. Now, in the, in, 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 the, in the ancient times, the parents look at the children and say, it's about time for you to get married. Why? Children doesn't know when they're supposed to get married. They just think they do. But they, I mean, parents, we know when our children are already making money. If your children keep asking money from you, they're not ready for anything. You know, they, they, they need to be independent. They need to be making money for themselves. Before, because if that thing got married before they can support themselves, you're going to pay for it. Okay? You're going to pay for it. And you don't want to pay for it. I mean, no parents wants to pay for the marriage of their children. Believe me. You don't want to pay for it. That's too much burden. You are called to support your family, but not other families. Okay? So, here, he sent his servant Eleazar to find a wife for Isaac. Remember, this Eleazar was supposed to be the heir if he has no children. But now he's not the heir. And so, he sent Eleazar in, in, to look for a wife for Isaac. What he's saying is, I don't want Isaac to just marry anybody. Now, parents, listen to this. You don't want your children to just marry anybody. A parent who says, well, my, my children can choose anybody they want. Really? What if they fall in love with Satan? They can choose anybody? That is not Bible. Okay? That is not Bible. I, I told my boys, I'll be very upset if I am the second person who found out whom they are dating. And I mean it. Because I want my input. I want to be able to know whom they like, whom they are dating, and believe me, I talk to my kids. I talk to them. Hey, you're getting close to this person. Do you love that person? And, and we talk, I force the conversation. I want to have my say. Abraham had his say. I want my say. And now, if you don't want my say, you can leave the house. That's what I told him. I said, we can make the arrangement. You can leave the house. You can keep eating my food and uh, enjoying the utilities I pay for and then not listen to my voice. That's not going to work. Okay, so Abraham said, 
Well, Isaac, and you can see later how old Isaac was. Hey, Isaac, it's about time for you to get married. You know? So he, uh, he did not say, so uh, Isaac, go find a woman. No, he told Eliezer, 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 you're older, with more wisdom. Go find a wife for my son. It grieved. Now, some people will say, well, well, in those days, it's possible. Have you read your Bible? Uh, one of the, two of the sons of Isaac are named Esau and Jacob. Did Esau listen to his father and whom to marry? No, in those days, disobedience is disobedience. In those days, there are disobedient children. And so Esau disobeyed Isaac and married women that grieved Isaac. Same thing today. Whom did, whom did uh, Jacob marry? From the family that, that, uh, that Isaac approved of. And so he was not grieved with the marriage of Jacob. He was grieved with the marriage of Esau. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of parents today who are grieving at the dating life and marriage of their children. Well, because you never exercise leadership. And you never have a say on this kind of uh, important uh, decision that your children are making. So, <clears throat> because Esau grieved his dad Isaac, Esau did not get the blessing. Uh, it was Jacob who got the blessing. He also sent all the children born after Sarah out of the camp. He gave them gifts. I don't know how much, but he gave them gifts. He sent them eastward. Now, this is, this is very interesting to me. Why in the world will, will Isaac send them eastward? The probability is the family of these uh, concubines came from the east. But eastward is where? Where is eastward? Which is? Which is where? That's where Abraham came from. Why did Abraham choose eastward? That is their choice. If you will notice the life of Abraham, he gave people choice like Lot. Where do you want to go? So when he was talking to these people, the concubine says, we want to go east. That is still their tendency. Even after living with Abraham for decades, they did not catch the faith. They did not catch the promised land. They want to go east. But this is after decades of living with Abraham. They did not. Some people just don't want it. They just don't want the covenant. They just don't want God. And we have to recognize that there are some people who are going to hell. Because they choose to. God is giving an offer. But they refuse to live by faith. Now that is a sad commentary. But that is what is in the scripture. Now, uh, specifically, he sent them away from his son. At this age, if, if Isaac got married after Sarah died, which was, which means he was uh, in his 40s, in his late, late uh, 30s or 40s. And then 38 years later, Abraham died. This means that when he sent his other children away, Isaac is at least in his 70s. A 70-year-old son with a 175-year-old father. Now, any children here who is in their 70s? He was already in his 70s, and yet his dad still has a say on how he lives. That's why I'm telling you this, um, this, this Western philosophy, this American, 18 years old, you can do whatever. That's not from God. I'm telling you that's from the devil. Because we have a lot of people who doesn't know how to even live yet, make decisions, being allowed to do whatever they want. Here, Isaac was already in his 70s, and Abraham is he still sending troubles away? He sent his children away from Isaac when Isaac was 70. 
Okay, now listen to this. Abraham was sending troubles away from his sons, from his son. As far as he can, away from his son. The error of today is not only are we not sending troubles away from our children, we are sending our children to trouble. Yeah. Hey, Dad, Mom, I'm going to go there. What are they doing there? Well, they're they're going to do this. Okay, go, go ahead. Just, just be careful. But they are going to trouble. And we're allowing it. Abraham was sending troubles away from his son. It's a big problem when we are willing to send our children into trouble. Are you, are you seeing this? This is really very clear at the plain reading of the scriptures. You don't even need that much interpretation. So some of the philosophies that we have today, raising our children, on how to raise our children, is not from God. They came from the pagan concepts that is not from Western philosophy, but from the, from, from the ancient times. They came from pagan concepts, allowing their children to do whatever they want. That's a pagan concept. That is not a faith concept. So perhaps some people are espousing, I know some Christians are espousing, my children can do whatever they want. That is not a faith concept. That is a pagan concept. And, and Christians, because they refuse to think and study, they fell for this, and they think that they are mature and they are enlightened because they are making those decisions. No. Uh, the Bible says, raise up your children in the way that they should go. So when they are old, they are not going to depart from it. Not only are you going to raise them up on where they should go, but raise them in such a way that that, uh, that, that concept will be curved in their brains and their spirits. That even when you're long dead, it's so engraved in their spirit, they're not going to depart from it. That much discipleship. <laughs> and, and, we, and, and we we have entrusted discipleship to schools. Boy, you know, my, my son was asking me, if, if that, Papa, if you're raising your kids right now, are you going to send them to CPS? I said, no. Most probably I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do homeschooling. Why? Because of the kind of garbage that is in our public school system right now. You know, I mean, they're changing everything. The government right now think that they should raise our children. And they will lie while doing it. They'll say, no, we don't need that. Yeah, but that's what you're doing. You know. Uh, and, and they want to pay, you to pay for it as well. Okay? So, but this is an amazing scripture that he sent them away from Isaac. He sent trouble away from Isaac. God already told us how to do it right. All we need to do is, is uh, how to follow. So, if our children are not growing up in the ways of the Lord, God says, raise your children in the fear and knowledge of God. So, if our children are not growing up in the ways of the Lord and they're not following the ways of the Lord, it only means one thing then. We have not raised them up properly. Now, parents lament this all the time. Oh, my children, what about you? You're supposed to set them up in the ways that they should go. By the way, we, uh, we found this in school. My, my children all graduated from Edgebrook, and they are all going uh, to Jones for high school. Now, this is they what they found out. The way they do math in Edgebrook is different from the way they do math in Jones. And so on the first year, it's always the trouble of my kids because they are so set on the ways of Edgebrook that when they go to Jones, they need some re-education. Now, it is complicated by the fact that their tutor is my wife. Edgebrook has a way, my wife has a way, and Jones has a way. So what happened to my kids? They lost their way for a while. And they are fighting. And this is, by the way, what is happening to us. Yeah, it's what happened to us. 
the Lord sets us the way. This is the way that you should walk in it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there are multiple elements competing for different ways. And they are very proud of it. But there is only one way. There is no modern inventions, technological advancement, or modern philosophies that can replace the word of the Lord. And uh, we are just being deceived to think, oh, this is the 21st century, this is how we think now. Guys, open your eyes. Did you see how, how our society is destroying families? Americans have destroyed, um, American society have already self-destruct. You know, the, the other one, communism and socialism. China have, have found out <laughs> Majority of their population is old because of the one-child policy. Now, this is the communist government thinking they're, oh, they're smart. We're the biggest, we're the most densely populated uh, people on the face of the earth. One out, one, out, one out of every four individual is a Chinese. One out of seven is what? Indian. Yeah. Can you imagine one out of seven is Chinese? One out of four is, Ch is Chinese. One out of seven is Indian. They're going nowhere. You know? So the Chinese said, well, we're smart. So a few decades ago, they, they, they say, one-child policy. Well, there is a big problem there. Because of one-child policy, what, what happened? Majority of their population is old. Nobody is going to pay for their retirement because there is less young people working. Oh, they thought they're smart. That's the decline of the Chinese uh, society. They're, they're, it's not obvious, but it is. The situation, same thing with America. The government leaders thought they're very smart, so they say, let's convert social security contribution into a tax. Well, there's another problem. You've got, you've got people because the prosperity doesn't want to have children. Who do you think is going to pay for the Social Security for the retirees when there are less working people? And then couple it down with COVID, who's going to pay for it? It's not going to come from the moon. You see, this is how wise they are. Just foolish. Thinking that they, they can control how many people should be on earth? God already said, uh, populate the whole earth. You, you think the earth is fully populated? No. I mean, there are population concentrations, but you travel, you know there's a lot of space around. You know? There are some countries people don't want to live. This is engineered by the modern social engineers who doesn't have God. You see? So we as believers should really Take it to heart. I mean, relatively, as I look at everybody here, we're all young. We really have to follow God on how to raise our children. If we don't, that's the end of it, you know. Now, after he died, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, where Sarah was buried. So, you can ask the question, did these two already made peace? Also, at this point, Ishmael was already extremely wealthy. And so because he was extremely wealthy, he doesn't care about how much, how much uh, Isaac had. He's also rich, okay? Remember, he's, he's the father of 12 uh, kingdoms also. And verse 8 says, Abraham was gathered to his people. Again, what people? What people? Is this a statement of faith knowing that one day that land will belong to his people? His people is about to be born. Remember jo Joseph when he was dying, he said, hey, don't forget my bones. He wants to be buried with his fathers. And where was Joseph buried? Where Abraham was buried. Yeah. You see the, the, the prophetic insight of these people? Everything is about faith. Everything is about what God promised because this is the land that God gave us. I want, I want to be buried here. There is no people. There's only Sarah, okay? He doesn't even want to be buried with his father. You know? My, my wife told me this, that her family, 
uh, has, has lots for a burial in the Philippines. I, I told my wife a long time ago, do I care? Yeah? I, if she dies first, I can take care of her. Yeah? But, but you see, this is, this is the bondage that we have. Abraham doesn't have that. He is a man of faith. And he said, oh, no, don't, don't bury me with don't bury me with my father. Those are unbelievers there. He said, bury me with my people. What people? Well, this is the land of my people. They're not yet born, but this is the land of my people. That is faith. You see how extensive the life of faith is? You know? Now, personally, where, 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 where do I want uh, to be buried? I want to be buried where my children will bury me. Because children are supposed in peacetime to bury their fathers. Yeah. And, and uh, that's just my personal take on it, you know. Now, the passing of the blessing in verse 11, it says that God blessed Isaac after the death of Abraham. Now, this is not just a blessing. I want you to uh, begin to understand this, especially now. Because uh, I pumped gas this week and it's six plus. I mean, like, like, like all, around a year ago, there, there came a point our gas was less than $4. It doubled, guys. You know, it doubled. So, thank you for those who voted for Biden, you know. Uh, it doubled. In New York, I think ten dollars. Yeah. And it's not it's not gonna go down because they just say that inflation officially they increase it even more. So uh, but we are people of faith. So we have to shift our attention to that. We are supposed to live blessed by God. Galatians says this, that we also receive the blessing of Abraham by faith. Now it is important for me to point this out because at this point on the next chapter, what happened? There was drought, therefore there was famine in the land. There was massive recession. And so, and so when the Bible says, and God blessed Isaac, this was after Abraham died. The blessing of Abraham is now officially transferred to one man. His name is Isaac. And with that blessing on Isaac, he is now shielded officially from what Ever misfortune is coming on the face of the earth. Let, let me give you a statement of faith that all of you should know by now. Our blessing is not subject to the, economic, to the economics of this world. Okay? And we will, we will see this throughout, throughout the day. Because now that God has blessed Isaac, this blessing was passed on to him not while Abraham was alive, but after Abraham died. Because God will not just take the blessing from you. It's, it's supposed to sustain you for the rest of your life. Now, for as, for as long as I'm alive, the blessing of God in my life is mine. My children, if they follow the ways of the Lord, which is they also listen to my instructions, they will enjoy that blessing. If one of them decide to rebel against God and say, well, Papa, I don't want to listen to you anymore. Fine, we can arrange that. You leave the house. That's first. Okay? And you, you feed yourself. Because they want to live on their own. That's what, that's what Abraham did to law. Yeah. And that's what Abraham did, I think, to, to the others. Now, it's not mentioned there, but you can, you can read between the lines easily on that one. So the, pla the, the passing of the blessing in verse 11 is after the death of Abraham. 
This is the Abrahamic blessing. This is covenant blessing that we read in chapter 15. This is what this is what was not given to Ishmael. Now God told God told uh, Abraham, I also bless Ishmael. Came from you after all. I mean, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. If Ishmael is going to be a nation, then he will be blessed because he came from Abraham. But that is not the blessing. You know, the Bible says, God sends rain even to the unjust. There are natural laws that God set in motion. Diligence brings wealth. Even if you are unjust, if you are diligent, you will make money. Now, even if you are a believer, if you are lazy, you will suffer. You will be poor. Because poverty awaits those who are uh, couch potatoes. You know, the, the book of Proverbs says that. So you can, you can claim all you want. Well, I live by faith. If you are lazy, you will be poor. But if you are diligent, even if you are an unbeliever, that's a promise of God. That's a natural law. Diligence brings wealth. So now that blessing is passed to Isaac. He is now officially blessed. Only a child of faith can get this. Say DJ decide to backslide. I cannot lay hands on him and she will have the blessing. It's not going to work. Because it's a faith-to-faith -faith communication. Even if you want your child who is not living by faith to have it, they're not going to have it. That's why a lot of parents will be wasting their money. They're not going to have it because the blessings of God can only be received by faith. Well, I gave it to my child who doesn't want to follow God. Then you're just squandering what God gave you. You see? Well, I hope, forget your hope because we are talking about faith here, okay? So we will see the value of this blessing later. Let's, let's go to chapter 26. Chapter 26 of, of uh, Genesis. There was another famine in the land in addition to the one that occurred in Abraham's time. Okay? So the, the challenge to Abraham's faith is now a challenge to Isaac's faith. <clears throat> Let's face it. As a parent, as a father, I don't want my children to experience any difficulties. Okay? That's idealistic. It's not going to happen. <laughs> the same famine that took place in the times of Abraham now is taking place in the times of Isaac. Even as me and my wife's faith have been challenged so many times, the faith of my children is going to be challenged. And so if I don't prepare them properly, they can fail. Knowing that they can fail, I have to prepare them not to fail. You cannot just ignore things because of faith. You have to pay attention to things because of faith. The devil is a lie. And so he will try to steal, kill, and destroy even our children. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines at Gerar, the Lord appeared to him there. Because during this time, it's under the rulership of Egypt. The Lord appeared to Isaac there and says, Do not go down to Egypt. Because here is Philistines. You go down that coastal road and you're going to, uh, you'll be in Egypt. In today's tribal time, in, in a couple of hours. Do go down to Egypt. Live in the land that I tell you about. That's in the promised land. Stay in this land. As an alien. And I will be with you and bless you. I know there is famine, Isaac. But I want you to live here. And I will be with you and I will bless you. For I will give all these lands to you and your offspring. And I will confirm the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. God told Isaac, I want you to stay here because this is yours. And wherever I send you, that's where the blessing is. <clears throat> And by the way, I need to remind you that I gave this to Abraham. I will make the same words now that he gave to Abraham. <clears throat> I, 
I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give you offsprings, all these lands, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. How, how is God talking to Isaac now? Like Abraham. Huh? God is now talking to Isaac the way he's talking to Abraham. You know, it will be a blessing when, when one day God begins to talk to my children the way he talks to me. <laughs> Joel is so persuaded, he said. Hey, Papa, <clears throat> did God ever talk to you? I said, yes. <sighs> he doesn't love me. I said, why? He doesn't talk to me. I said, of course he's, he's, he wants to talk to you. And he, he, he's talking to you, you're not just listening. H how do you listen? So you can only teach someone to, to, to a little kid like that. So I told him, you have, you've got to listen to your spirit, you know. Be, you begin to plant those seeds. And, and, and James went like, Joel went like this. After a few seconds, he still doesn't like him. <laughs> he's not talking to me. <laughs> my kids will not receive guidance from the Lord on how to lead my family. Never. They'll get it after I die. Yeah. Whoever runs my family after I die will get it from God. God will never bypass me. You know. Like in this church. God will never bypass me in this church. The moment I'm gone, or you have a new pastor, and God will talk to that person. But not now. I'm still here. So if, any, if, if anybody has any idea that God is telling them how to lead the church, you're listening to somebody else, not to God. God will never bypass his leaders. That much I know from the scriptures. Wake up to that. Okay, so, in the same way, I like it because now God is not changing anything. He's not saying, well, you know this, what I told Abraham, because Abraham is like this. Now that you're in charge, I'm going to do this. Those are hallucinations. The exact words that God has been telling Abraham, he is now telling Isaac. Because have you noticed? You tell your children, hey, this is what God says. Your children says, yes, Papa. But the moment they turn around and say, really? They don't believe you 100%. They think you're making things up to control them. Oh, but now that he's dead, God began to talk to Isaac. And Isaac said, whoa, wait a minute. That's exactly what my father Abraham told me. God told him. Now he is telling me. Okay? <clears throat> I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give your offspring all these lands. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. Because Abraham listened to me and kept my mandate, my commands, my statutes, and my instruction. So Isaac settled in Gerar. Isaac sowed seed in that land. Now, pay attention to this. Isaac sowed seed in that land. And in that year, he reaped a hundred times and what was sown. How can he sow seed in times of famine? God told him, I will bless you. God's blessing is not subject to the economics of this world. Why was there famine? Later on, you will find that they were they were. They were uh, going around digging wells because there's no water. There was drought. He planted during times of drought. But even during times of drought, because he planted to where God wants him to be, he was in the center of God's will. He reaped the harvest of a hundredfold return. He had flocks. Well, verse, verse 13. And the man, <clears throat> in times of famine, and the man became rich. And kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. Huh? You know, there's a lot of people who's, who's, who's very upset. Man, during COVID, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, made a couple of billions in one week. Elon Musk made more money. What do you care? Did you do anything about that? Did Jeff Bezos steal from you? Did Elon Musk steal from you? No, he doesn't even know you. 
they know how to make money. Don't resent other people because they know how to make money. It's not your money. The government does that. They resent because other people know how to make money. And the government wants to spend the money they're making. But the government doesn't know how to make money. These people are just blessed. Okay? Now, I know the relationship with God. Is it because of pure diligence that they are making this wealth? But it's none of your business. Okay? None of your business. But if you are living by faith and God bless you, even during times of drought, God can bless you. The Bible says he kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. It, it's in, in Hebrew, it's in the superlative, meaning extremely wealthy. Okay? He had flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and many slaves. And the Philistines were envious of him. This is what... You know that you are getting wealthy and you're becoming very wealthy if the people around you start being envious. Yeah? Wealth invites envy from those who doesn't have it. Yeah. So if the Philistines he stopped up all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of his father, Abraham, filling them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Leave us, for you are much too powerful for us. Now, the whole land of the Philistines in Gerar became poorer than Abraham. I mean, they, they dig up well, what happened? No water. What happened when there's no water? The sheep become skinny. They cannot reproduce. But Abraham's sheep have water. Wherever he digs, there is water. Until they decided, well, we can't have water. They stop all the wells of Isaac. How do they stop the well? They put st stones. What did Isaac do? He dig another well. What happened? He found water. Now, it's not because Abraham, uh, Isaac, is a great geologist. He doesn't even know that geology exists, okay? You know what the Bible says? God will bless all the works of your hands. Are you listening? You know what that means? It means God will bless all the works of your hands. You say, well, how come what I'm doing is not blessed? That's not my problem. That's your problem. That's why you have to walk by faith. Because when you walk by faith, all the works of your hands are blessed. Amen. Amen. When God pronounces blessing on you, it cannot be stopped by drought. It cannot be stopped by recession. It cannot be stopped by COVID. It can't be stopped. I, I told Brother Willie during, you know, at the height of COVID, hey, but really, uh, my wife was, was given a house, and he, and he was just rejoicing. Wow, he said, in COVID time, I said, hey, brother, really, I'm debt free. And he was just rejoicing. I said, hey, the, the church is fully paid. And he was just rejoicing. This is why we are in the midst of COVID, while other churches are selling their buildings. We paid up our building. You know why? We're blessed. Amen. <laughs> We're just blessed. If, if you live by faith, now these people with no faith will never understand this. They'll say, oh, what are they talking about? Of course you will not understand it. But if you have been listening to the word and you know what the word says, this is how not only survive, this is how we prosper in times of famine. Now, take note, it is the blessing that kept Isaac well sustained even in times of famine. Why, why is it God keeps telling him, I'll bless you? Because he's forgetting it. You know, when the moment we are faced with difficulties, we forget the blessing. Oh, re re recession. Sometimes my, my wife wants to panic me. Oh, you know what's, what's happening? I said, no, I don't know. Do you want to know? No, I don't want to know. Yeah. Because... 
You don't have to invite bad news to come to you. It comes to you. It looks for you. Bad news will look for you because bad news wants to affect the way you think. And the moment it possesses you, you will think like the bad news and you will invite the bad news. This is the time when we should be concentrating and studying even more the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we should learn how to walk by faith, how to walk in the blessings of Abraham. That, you know that Christians, we have not, we have not walked at par with that. You know why God is blessing the Gentiles? <clears throat> God has always, a, always has a purpose. And we are Gentiles. The reason why God is blessing the Gentiles is to make his people envious. What do you mean to make his people envious? The, the nation of Israel. Now, to a certain degree, in times past, the nation of Israel was envious of uh, how, how others are developing and they are not. Especially when the land was, was not given to them. Boy, right now they are very blessed, you know. And <laughs> they have something to be envious to us about. But that is the extent of God's blessing. We, we are still living in the times of the Gentiles, okay? And in the times of the Gentiles, God wants to bless us so much that it will, it will make his people envious. Why does he want to make his people envious? So that they can come to him. When John Austin was alive, he said, he went, he went to a dealership. During that time, Toyota Celica was still new. Okay? It was top of the line for Toyota. And he looked at the Toyota Celica and he says, I like that. So he went to the dealership and says, I want to buy that. And, and the owner of the dealership is Jewish. And he knows he's a preacher. And John Austin tells the story. The, the owner of the dealership I smile at him and said, Sir, I know you're a pastor. This is a very expensive car. And John Austin says, I know, and I'll buy that. And, and he said, Well, sir, I'm telling you, whoever has the money to buy this, I will not wait for you. I'll sell this. And John Austin says, I'm buying that. And, and, and the Jewish owner smiled at him. You know. One week later, John Austin came back to the dealership and says, Sir, what do you want? I want that car. I said, well, sir, if you have the money, uh, you can buy that. But whoever has the money, I'll sell it to him first. And said, I'll buy that. Second week, after, and then finally he came and says, I'm buying that. And the owner was laughing at him. And he said, I have the cash. I'm buying it now. And the dealership owner says, where did you get the money? He said, from the blessings of Abraham that you rejected. And John Austin says, I like it when I said that. Because that's the reason why God wants to bless us. Now, is there anything that they have to be envious to us about? If, if, they are, if, 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 we, want, if we want their money, not, not, not ours? I'm telling you, we're not living at par with the blessing. Because we don't know how to live in the blessing. We don't even know how to keep the blessing. Because sometimes the Lord will bless us, and we don't know how to keep the blessing. We waste it on people with no faith. I mean, we, we just don't know how to handle it. But if you know how to handle it, God will bless you. And God will, will cause you to increase your wealth. And the Bible has become very powerful. So, if you look at that passage, from the context of that time, preachers go up and say, look at this. And I have nothing against their preaching. Sowing in times of famine. And so now... The preachers will say, so in times of famine, give your money to me. That's what they say. Now, again, I, I have nothing against giving in the offering. I'm a preacher, so I like it, you know. Uh, nothing against that. But let's concentrate right now. And by the way, books have been written on it. Let's concentrate right now in the context of when Isaac sowed in times of famine. So how do you sow in times of famine? You cultivate the soil, right? 
Whose soil are you cultivating? Your soil. You're not planting in my soil. Right? So you're cultivating your soil. After you cultivate your own soil, where do you plant the seed? In your own soil. Not on the other soil. So where did the seed grow? In your own soil. Not on the other soil. Why did it grow? Because it's your own soil. It's not the other soil. Actually, when, when Isaac planted, he was planting in obedience to God. What God is telling him, hey Isaac, I don't care if it is drought time or famine time. I will keep blessing you. So you keep planting. I will increase your wealth. Isaac did not give to anybody. He did not. Was there a church in those days? Teaching, plant, sowing, and reaping? No, he did not give to anybody. He gave to his own land. He took what God gave him and God prospered it. Now, I'm sure Isaac was a giver, but certainly he was giving to no preacher. That principle of sowing and reaping is actually, you are sowing where God planted you and I will bless you there. Keep sowing to where I put you in. That's why I'm, I, I've been telling you this, guys. Do not curse your own jobs. God can prosper you there. You know, my boss is so stingy. I wish this company goes under. Well, the company goes under. What happened? You just curse it. You'll suffer with it. Mm -hmm. Isaac did not go to his land and say, Oh, this drought is affecting, affecting my land. I'm not going to have any harvest. No, no. He planted in his land. He did not curse his land. You know how I know he did not curse his land? He planted in his own land. He stopped cursing your own blessing. I, I don't like this house. I want this house to be burned. You live in that house, you better bless that house. I can't wait to leave this house. That's where you eat. Don't curse it. It's your blessing. These are simple principles. Isaac did not give to any preacher. He did not give to any church. He planted, he cultivated what God blessed him. That's what sowing in famine is. In cultural context. He cultivated what he has. He did not curse it. Our problem, we keep cursing what we have. You know. I mean, even Christians keep cursing this nation. We keep cursing what we have. People in those days were going around their land and cursing their land. Oh, this rotten land. You know how today, this cursed land. Well, if it's your land, it's blessed. If it's your work, God has to bless it. If it's your business, God has to bless it. Oh, you know, a business is hard right now. Like everybody else, we're going under. You just curse your business. You just cursed it. Because you don't know how to sow in times of a famine. He actually cultivated. That is the kind. Now, I have nothing against anybody preaching, sowing in famine, giving to others. Nothing against that. But I'm telling you the context of sowing in famine in the life of Isaac. He planted in his own soil. He nurtured was God. How do I know he nurtured it? Because he was thinking of going to Egypt. He's, he's like Elimelech. Man, this is, there's famine in the land. I'm, I'm, I cannot work on, on my own land. There's no water. It's curse. I'm going to Moa. He cursed his own land. Yeah. What was Isaac doing? He was trying to copy his father Abraham. I'm going to Egypt. There's food in Egypt. He was about to curse his own land. He says, no, 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 no. You stay where I want you to stay. Cultivate what I want you to cultivate, where I bless you, and I will bless you. Now remember, you already have the blessing of your father Abraham. Now listen, we have the blessing of Abraham also. We have Jesus. In, in, in times like this, if, if you pray for a job, God give you a job, be the best worker in that job. 
do not curse that job. You know, sometimes people jo work in a company and the first thing that they do is complain about their boss. Well, you know, my boss is not following me. Well, your boss is not supposed to follow you. That's why he's the boss. You're an employee. You know, actually, my boss wants me to work extra. Well, you want to lose your job? Don't work extra then. So, some Christians just keep cursing their own land, their own work. Why curse it? The reason why your boss wants you to do your job, an extra job, is because maybe he trusts you. And if you just be, learn how to be obedient and not be proud, maybe he will promote you. But you're cursing the job and he can hear it, he'll get rid of you. Yeah. You know, sometimes my kids will, 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 will complain, Mama, I don't, I don't like this, this food. And, and my wife will be very upset because, you know, I'm, I'm home cooking. My, my kids will be ordering food and my wife will tell me or they ask me, sweetheart, what do, what, what do you want? I said, just reheat. What mama's cook, my wife's cooking is better than, than McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or, or whatever. It's better. And so my wife sometimes will be upset and she'll say, cook what you want. Spend your own money. Well, because you're cursing the land. You know? We have, to, we have to learn how to train as uh, fathers, train our children to appreciate what God gave them. Are you listening? Don't pretend you're asleep, you're not, okay? We have to learn how to, we have to train our children to appreciate what the Lord has blessed us with. I, I, I don't like this house, I don't like their food. Buy your own food, see what happened. Go rent a place. Pay, pay it on your own. See what happened. You are cursing something that the Lord has blessed you with. That's why some children are walking away from the blessing. Why are they walking away from the blessing? Because they don't want to walk in the blessing. They were not raised properly. You know, they were not raised properly. Let's raise... We're going to really celebrate being parents. Yesterday, somebody was talking to me in the party of DJ and Joel. Uh, and I was sharing to him. That, he said, I, I listen, I said, I'm a pastor. This is what I do. This guy was actually asking me how to raise his newborn child. He's not a believer. Uh, because he, he saw Joel. He, he, he got to know my kids. He loves John. How, how do you raise your kids? He is asking a believer. And I was sharing it to him. That's why I'm telling you, witnessing is, is your life. I didn't open the conversation. He opened it up. I don't have to ask him. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Happy Father's Day. We'll continue tonight, okay? Let's, let's all stand. Praise God. Hallelujah.